Um, and now we have the good fortune of another presentation um, from a prolific uh, sociologist, author, uh, Dr. Angel Harris, uh, who will be presenting educational disparities from one soci from one sociologist. Uh, very excited to see what he has to present. I first was made aware of him through Martha's Vineyard um, panel discussion, I believe, with Dr. Henry Lewis Gates and uh, Michelle Ree and Diane Ravitch. That was a very interesting <laughs> panel discussion. And so uh, when I found out he was at Duke, I couldn't help but reach out. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Angel Harris. Anyone hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. I'm not a podium stander, so I like to move around. Uh, okay, so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about the achievement gap, and I'm going to also uh, repeat some of the previous presentation in terms of some of the numbers, uh, but it'll provide you with some context. So first I'm going to begin by saying, so I'm going to talk about the problem, right, the achievement gap, and how I think we don't respect the problem. Right? There's a lack of respect for this problem. The other thing I'm going to talk about is how we're spinning our wheels. And this is why I think the problem persists. Right? And then the third thing I'm going to talk about is where we should focus our attention. Some of it is rooted in empiricism, and some of it is gut. Right? Uh, OK, so here's the problem. This is the achievement gap. What I'm showing you here are data from the NAEP. And these are 12th graders. And each test is scaled so that 300 is considered proficient. The bold line represents the proficiency line. 12th graders again. And you're looking at the <coughs> whites, blacks, and Hispanics. What you see is that white 12th graders are closer to being proficient than black and Hispanic 12th graders. Right? But in order to give you a sense of the gap, the magnitude, I'm going to put up a red line. This red line corresponds to white 8th graders. So what you see here is that on average, white, uh, black and Hispanic 12th graders are graduating high school with the skill sets that whites had in the 8th grade. Mm -hmm. So another way of saying that is that it's a four-year gap. Right? Or that on average, black and Hispanic 12th graders are graduating high school with eighth grade skill set. This is an over uh, uh, estimate of how good blacks and Hispanics are doing relative to whites. Right? Because this is among the persisters. So in order to be, have made it to the 12th grade. Okay? So it's worse than this. Put a pin in that. <laughs> Achievement gap is large and pervasive. This is the gap across a wide range of subjects, writing, reading, math, science, US history. Again, for whites, Asians and whites, Hispanics and blacks. I'm going to highlight the bar for blacks. Slightly more than half, this is national data, again, Nate. Uh, slightly more than half of blacks are proficient in reading, and less than a third are proficient in math, science, and US history. Hispanics aren't doing too much better. <clears throat> so when you think about the problem, it spans across a wide range of subjects. You can't just focus on reading, you can't just focus on math. How is the gap changing over time? We know that every decade, the US Department of Education collects large national data, right? And these data tend to be longitudinal where we can track students moving over time, okay? And so what I'm showing you here is the black-white achievement gap uh, for 12th graders from the equal opportunity uh, equal Education Opportunity Survey of 1965, National Opportunity Survey of 1972, High School and Beyond of 1980 and 82, the National Education Longitudinal Survey of 1992, and the Education Longitudinal Survey of 2006. Now, again, this is the black-white gap in these decades for 12th graders. Because we're going across time, across tests, this, the gap is standardized to account for that, right? So what you see is that from 65 to 92, there was a study by Hedges and Newell in which they projected that the gap was declining by 0.12 standard deviations per decade. What does that mean? This was published in 99. So their projections are only good through 92. <coughs> so what that means is that in 1992, the gap stood at 0.7 standard deviations. They projected that it's declining by this many standard deviations every decade. Okay given the rate decline from 65 to 92, which means that you have to subtract this about five times, five to six times to get to zero. That's five to six decades before the gap would close in reading. Given the rate of decline from 65 to 92 
absent any major intervention. We're talking five to six years, if things keep, five, six decades, if things keep progressing the way they are. Now that's reading, this is math. Look at the projection. So you can do the math and see this is gonna take slightly more than 10 decades for the gap to close in math. We're talking a little over a century. Okay. Now, these data are rather old, right? The projection stopped in 92, and even the data that I showed you before is rather old. So I'm gonna show you the gap on perhaps the most consequential of exams. And here's the SAT. This determines for a lot of people what college you go to, if you can go to college, right? And here I'm showing you the, the, the achievement in reading and verbal for white, Asians, Mexican Americans, and blacks. The scores don't matter. What matters is that the lines are parallel, right? So there's no convergence. So I just showed you some projected convergence from 65 to 92. Well, what's happened since the mid 90s to now? Whatever convergence we saw has stalled. And so now these lines are parallel. So we haven't even begun to cut into the five to six decades for reading and the 10 decades in math. This is reading, this is math. Now at one point I was optimistic because here, 2014, I thought these lines were gonna drastically converge in 2014. And the reason why was because the No Child Left Behind Act told us that the goal of the act was to close the gap by 2014, <laughs> right? And so in 2013, I got excited and I said, wow, they're gonna get us now, you know? I can't wait to see what they unveil, you know? Uh, that was either, they were really ambitious with the goal uh, or they were completely unaware of the data and the projected trends, right? Or they just didn't respect the gap, all right? Now I've shown you the gap on, uh, you know, I've shown you that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's big, it's a four-year gap, it's pervasive, it spans across a wide range of subjects, it's persistent, it's been around for a long time, doesn't seem to be going anywhere. It also exists on non-tests. Everything I showed you is based on tests, right? Here we have GPAs. The way to read this graph is that the bold line represents the average GPA nationally. So the average GPA nationally in 2001, the average GPA was 3.3. Whites were 3.36. Therefore, whites were this much above the national average GPA in 2001. In 2011, they were this much above the national GPA. So that's how you read this graph. So this is for whites, Asian Americans, above the national average, both 2001-2011 for blacks and Hispanics, okay? So they're below the national average. Now again, the lines for this are, the lines, the lines here in terms of trends are parallel. So I'm in the process of writing a book and in it I'm going through, um, actually I had to open, I'm going through some of these, some of these, uh, some of these data presenting it and uh, here is the, so this is in the process right now. No one's seen this before. Fresh. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> this is fresh, fresh, fresh. So 1.3 for a book that does not exist. Uh, what you see is 1990 to 2009. This is national data uh, GPA. GPAs, again, don't matter. What matter here are the, 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 the lines of parallel. Okay? So you see that the lines are pretty parallel, and this is from oh, uh, 2001, 2012. Same thing we see with the testing gaps, right? The lines are just parallel, right? If they go up, they go up together, they go down together. So there you go. So that's that. That's the. Okay. So back. Yeah. Okay. Why should we all care about this? Why should we all care about this? Um, you know, I hear a lot of, uh, you know, the, the appeal to close the achievement gap, a lot of times people go to, to a moral appeal, right? Say, hey, you know, uh, we should care about all our children and even those that don't look like us. And so I hear those types of appeals. And, and I don't think those are effective, right? I, I just don't think they're effective. Uh, 
So I think this one is more effective. So the reason why we should all care about this problem is because here is the population in the US, percent non-white and percent white. The bold line represents the 50% mark. So it's US population. And what you see is that this is in 2000, in 2010, 2020, from here forward is projections, 2030, 40, 50. Let's just stop at 2030. This is 2030. It's not a long time from now, right? 2050, who, who knows, you know. But 2030, that's 15 years from now. No, 14 years from now, okay? So that's not a long time from now. You cannot have nearly half your population walking around with eighth grade skill set. There is no way that's not a problem. It's going to affect your kids. If you're in a country in which 40% of the population has eighth grade skill set, you're not going to be as competitive as another country in which 2%. <clears throat> you see what I'm saying? In order to remain competitive, you know, you, you want more of your population at the forefront of innovation. So even if your kids are doing well, uh, you know, it, it's, it's in your best interest, it's in their interest to ensure that as a country, we don't have nearly half the population walking around eighth grade skill set. It's a problem. And I think we don't respect this problem. That's why people say, oh, we're going to close this within the next year or two. You know, they don't respect it. I would never walk into the office of an oncologist and say, you guys have had millions of dollars invested in cancer research for <laughs> decades. I need a cure for cancer by next week. I wouldn't do that because I respect that problem. This is on the same level as that. This is cancer. We're not going to cure it in a year or two. It required, you saw the projections, decades. Absent any major intervention. Keep that in mind. Coming back to that. So why does the problem persist? So I think we're spinning our wheels. And before I go into that, let me say, I, this is really, it's, it's a really important topic for me personally. And the reason why is because, so I'm, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. So I grew up in Brooklyn. And I was raised with my grandmother. And I grew up in Gowana's houses in the projects in Brooklyn. And for those people who haven't been to New York, so in New York, you know, the, the projects are these brown, brick brown buildings, uh, you know, shoot straight up into the sky. So I grew up on the 14th floor, uh, and it was just, you know, a lot of poverty, hard, you know. The, the crack epidemic hit hard in, in, in New York City projects. So I grew up during that time, in the mid-'80s, um, and no one in my family talked about college. My grandma had a ninth-grade education. My grandfather had a third-grade education, and the goal was finish high school and you have made it. <clears throat> that was it. And so in terms of colleges, I had never heard of colleges outside of New York City. Because if you're from New York and you're a native New Yorker and you're in the projects, you do know that the world does not extend beyond your borough. In fact, it doesn't extend beyond 20 block radius, right? right? And so we thought is New York is really downtown Brooklyn. Bronx, I didn't go up there too much. I don't know what's, what's there. Uh, Queens. I was, I was there. You was there? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Queens, you know, kind of merged with Brooklyn, and the only thing that's out there is like the Mets, you know, uh, and uh, Staten Island, no one knows what's there, so I didn't feel bad about that. But you don't know what's beyond New York City, and so we, I had never heard of like University of North Carolina. I never heard of this because I wasn't, New York is a pro town, pro sports, right? So college sports is not big. And so I didn't know about like University of Michigan, I, the concept that a state has a university, that, what, that didn't exist in my mind. I didn't have that. And so I knew about Brooklyn College because we lived in Brooklyn and LIU, Long Island University, because they had a campus in Brooklyn. And I knew about NYU because Theo Huxtable went to NYU. <laughs> I know about NYU. And at one point I wanted to go to Hillman. <laughs> uh, I don't know and now we know they were here. <laughs> You know, Columbia was a country, <laughs> okay? So uh, I, I did not have a good sense for the landscape of colleges. And we probably all know people who are born, raised, live in a, in a particular place, and they never leave that place, and they don't venture beyond that place. And that's really all they know. And that's what it was. So for me, my world was 20 block radius. My grandmother was even smaller. She couldn't walk there. It didn't exist. 
right? And so we grew up in a household with nobody had a car, you know, but it's not strange in New York. Anyway, so I went to a high school called Manhattan Center for Science and Math, where I proceeded to fail both science and math. And my high school GPA was a, we had average from zero to 100. It was 69 was my average for four years. And so in a class of 242 students, I graduated kid number 217. So that was my class rank when I graduated high school. So I was in the 10th percentile of my graduating class in high school. I was a very poor student. I was not gonna go to college. Instead, I was gonna go be a mortician. I wanted to be an embalmer. And so um, I was looking into that. I would you know, hang out at a funeral home. It was nice enough to let me go in and I'd go to the back and watch people get embalmed. And I said, I can do this, you know? It's respectable and it doesn't matter what's happening with the economy. It's, it's foolproof, you know? Uh, and so that's what I wanted to do. And I had a friend of mine who had twin aunts, Danette and Darlene, and they had completed their undergraduate work at Cornell. They were in law school, and they said, you should go to college. Try it out, see if you like the experience. I said, okay. They gave me four applications to complete. Lincoln and Pennsylvania, Hampton and Virginia, Morgan State, and Grambling State. I applied to these schools. I'd never heard of any of them. They're HBCUs. Never heard of any of them. I get into Grambling State. It's the only one that accepts me. But it's in Louisiana. I had no idea how I was going to get there. It wasn't even realistic for me to leave New York City, Brooklyn, to Louisiana. So I wasn't going to go. I wasn't thinking about it. Three days before dorm set to open, Danette calls me and says, hey, do you want to go or not? And I said, you know, sure. I mean, how would I pay for it? So she explains to me financial aid. She says, just pack your bag. We'll make it happen. So I'm telling my grandmother, I'm going to Grambling State University. Now, she had never heard of Grambling either because she didn't speak English. And so when the mail would come, she had no idea what what, the, what my mail was from Grambling State University. So I'm telling her, I'm going to this place called Grambling State University in Louisiana. And she had she, she thought Louisiana was in a different country. <laughs> it might as well be, but it's, but it's not. And so uh, so I, had, uh, I was trying to explain to her where it was. She understood in theory it was a good thing. She had you know, three major concerns. How are you gonna pay for it, All right? I'm explaining to her financial aid, which was just explained to me. Uh, and then uh, I was going off the grid, so she couldn't cognitive, cognitively place me. She didn't know where I was going to be. You know, like if you're at a friend's house, you have a mental image of where you are. I was going off the grid. And the other thing for her was I was 17, so if something happens to me, she could be charged with neglect. These were her concerns. Right? <laughs> but she understood in theory that it's a, it's a good idea, you know. So um, she saw that I wanted to go, and so... Anyway, the Ned and Darlene show up in a Crown, they rent a car, a 1993 Crown Victoria. They rent a car, it was the two of them and two of their friends from law school. I get in the car and we drive 24 hours straight. <laughs> they drive 24 hours straight to Louisiana. We stopped in Maryland for gas and I thought, man, this is a long way. <laughs> and we were four hours into 24 hours straight. <laughs> okay. And I remember thinking, man, this is beautiful. And I was talking about I-95 because I'd never been on the interstate before. If you're in New York City, there is no interstate that runs through the city. It's just not configured that way. And the closest thing we have to something like that would be like Central Park or Prospect Park where you just see just green all the way for hours. Anyway, so we, we get to Louisiana and we stopped, they paid for everything. Uh, and I realized the white folks were different from the white folks in New York, the black folks were different. There were no Latinos and no Asians. <laughs> and we go to, we get to Grambling State. Lynette takes me to the dorm room to check in and Darlene comes back with some paperwork. She says, you fill this out for your financial aid, you fill this out for your courses, here's where you register. And then after about 40 minutes, they gave me 30 bucks, got in the car and drove back to New York. And I was dropped off, sight unseen, Grambling State University, Northern rural Louisiana from Brooklyn, New York. And so um, that was an intervention for me. So I ended up, I majored in psychology because I thought you could read people's minds. I realized that that's not the case. Uh, <laughs> and when I was at Grambling, my first intro to psych class, first class I ever took, a professor gave an example that changed my world. He said, if you're trying to describe to someone that Johnny's misbehaving, the little kid's misbehaving, you, you can say Johnny's misbehaving. Or you can say, in the past hour, he has kicked three people, punched five, and slapped four others. Changed my world. Why? Because he gave me data. Not The data is that Johnny's just behaving. The data is, in this time period, here's what he has done. You can determine how much misbehavior is it. Is it a lot? Is it a little? You have the actual data. Empiricism. He introduced the notion of empiricism. Changed my world. I went through a bad stretch there where someone said to me, you know, I like this guy. I would say, you mean like? <laughs> What's like? I wanted them to define what that meant. Uh, but anyway, so I majored in, in psych, and then um, 
I went to Kansas State uh, for a master's in social, because Kansas State was the only school to accept me, so I went to Kansas State. And then from there, I applied to PhD programs in Michigan, was the only school to accept me, so I went to Michigan. I always say, you just need one. And so when I got to, I went to Michigan, I earned a PhD in public policy and sociology. And then from there, I was uh, recruited by UT Austin. And I was on the faculty at UT Austin for a year. And then from there, in my first year there, I was recruited by NYU and Princeton. And I went to Princeton and I was there for seven years. And in my seventh year there, I was recruited by Duke and Johns Hopkins. And I decided to come to Duke. The moral of that story is that I graduated kid number 217 mm -hmm. and I've never had to apply for a job. And I've had some great jobs, mm -hmm. right? And so the intervention is education. Right? I have a sister who's still in the same projects in New York. She has no idea what I do. She knows I teach and that's it. Right? She's the counterfactual. She is me without this intervention. And this intervention almost didn't happen. Stars had to line up. A lot of things had to go right. So when people say, would you go back in time and change anything? I said, no. I'm going to mess something up. Everything had to go exactly the way it went. Right? Uh, but the point is, this is why it's such a personal topic for me, because I can see it in my very life, right? So anyway, so to get back, we're spinning our wheels in terms of an explanation for why these disparities exist. And one is people focus, there's some people who have, you know, brought up the notion that perhaps there's a genetic deficiency among blacks and Hispanics, and this was put forward by Arthur Jensen, a uh, 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 psychologist from Harvard back in the 70s, and then Hernstein and Murray wrote the famous bell-shaped curve, uh, but this explanation is not really taken <coughs> seriously anymore, although there are some researchers at UNC Chapel Hill who are not there, but I think they're heading that direction. Uh, but you know, to, to debunk this intuitively, all you have to know is that uh, in the past uh, 30 years, right, um, well, people <coughs> seem to measure intelligence or get at the genetic portion of intelligence through IQ tests. In the past 30 years, the gap in IQ between whites and blacks has declined by 50%. If you believe in the genetic argument, then you have to believe that in the past 30 years, blacks have received some genetic boost that has somehow <laughs> evaded whites, right? Uh, and I think that genetic change happens over a much longer stretch of time. It could happen in 30 years, maybe, I don't know. But the point is, when you think about it that way, it's, it's, it's an intuitive way of thinking this, this explanation really doesn't hold. Uh, anyway, another one is resources, that blacks and Hispanics grew up in households in which had, you know, there are fewer resources. This accounts for about a third of the gap, right? And so that's why there's a gap in places like Princeton, New Jersey, Prince George's County, Maryland, Shaker Heights, Ohio, Chapel Hill. The reason why is because these are places that are relatively fluent, but you still have a gap and it's only about a third smaller than in other places. Mm -hmm. right, so this accounts for about a third of the gap. Other one is bias and testing. This one I'm gonna come back to and I'm gonna talk about a little later. Uh, this is where we are in the presentation, so you can follow each, each uh, square is a slide. Um, then you have schools perpetuate inequality. So some people suggest that schools perpetuate inequality to prepare kids to occupy the spaces from which they come. And uh, one of the ways, of, one of the mechanisms we'll be tracking would be a mechanism of doing this. Uh, the differential disciplinary stuff, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, then there's culture, right? There's a cultural deficiency among blacks and Hispanics. They don't wanna learn. That they resist academic gains. That in fact, if you're black, we hate academics so much that we even police each other. Right? If you do well academically, you're flagged for acting like the dominant group, i.e., you're acting white. Right? So this is an explanation that's been put forward to explain the achievement gap. So th these are they're, they're numerous explanations. These are just some of the popular ones. Right? <sighs> Search for the silver bullet. I think this is part of the problem. This is what I mean by spinning our wheels. We're searching for the silver We don't respect this problem. So we say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. And somehow it's going to solve it. And there's no respect for the problem. Charter schools is one. Parental involvement. Let's just get parents involved, right? Uh, cultural deficiency narratives is a problem, right? The notion that blacks don't value school. Um, uh, money, resources, uh, teacher quality. All of these are, you know, we, we're looking for the silver bullet. And a lot of these are based on gut ideology. So I'm a hardcore empiricist. And so what that means is that for me, 
I think when we approach these problems, we should optimize on two things. One, achievement, increasing achievement. That's it, nothing more. That's the outcome. There should be no other outcome. It shouldn't be whether you feel comfortable, whether you like this policy, I don't care what you like. <laughs> achievement, that's the outcome. And the other thing we optimize on is empiricism. That's it. In other words, if it's not backed by research, if we don't know, we're, we're not going to do it. We don't care what your gut tells you. Doesn't matter how you feel about it. Right? And so I'll talk a little bit about parental involvement. This is a big one. People say, oh, parental involvement, that's the way to go. And so I wrote a book called The Broken Compass, uh, published a couple of years ago. And this book angered a lot of people uh, because um, what did it was that I, I wrote an op-ed piece for New York Times. And New York Times, the day I sent it into them, and the next day it appeared in the New York Times, and they slapped the title, Friends and Involvement is Overrated. Mm -hmm. And forget about it. Mm -hmm. yes. Forget about it. Um, then the next week it was letters to the editor. People, a lot of people were angry and upset. And... Um, the, there was also a piece about in the Atlantic. The name of the book is The Broken Compass. So if you Google the title, it, a bunch of links will come up. Uh, anyway, so um, the book received a lot of attention, and a lot of people were upset about it. And when I knew that it had struck a nerve, was I ended up getting an email from the White House, and that turned into a call, and then that turned into an invite, and then I, that turned into a whole day there talking about parental involvement. Uh, and... My position on parental involvement is that uh, that's not it, that's not that's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. It's a problem. And I'll give you two examples. So the way the study, what I did in the study is, I take you know 60 different measures of parental involvement, 62, right? Read to the child, talk to them about their uh, uh, college plans, have a rule about homework, have a rule about GPA, help with homework, talk to the teacher. 62 of these things. All right, some you do at home, some you do it at school. And if you have these 62 things, imagine them like keys on a piano. And I said, okay, let's just take national data over the past four decades. Let's just take whites. And for each form of involvement, let's say help with homework, we're going to divide whites into the helpers and non-helpers. If this form of involvement works, then the children of the helpers, you guys are the helpers, the, the, the average achievement of this group should be higher than the average achievement of the non-helpers, right? Your kids should be doing better than them. You guys are the helpers, right? Then you say that form of involvement helps, right? What happens if their kids are doing better? That's suggestive that there's something that the helpers are doing that's ineffective. In fact, it's making it worse. And oftentimes what happens is there's no relationship. In other words, there's no difference in achievement between the two groups. Keep that in mind. So I did that with the 62 measures of involvement. And roughly about 12 to 15 percent show that the helpers, the children did better. So for involvement worked. For about 30 percent, this group did better. So it hurt. And for 50 percent, there was really no relationship. Right? And that was just for whites. Then you say, okay, let me see for blacks. It's a different set of keys that matter. Right? Uh, so you say for, for whites, it's, it's this, this, and this form. For blacks, it's that, that, and that. It's completely different. You look at Hispanics, it's a completely different set. There's no one size, there's no one size fits all. You can't tell parents, just do this. It's a mixed bag. And, 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 and you, tell, you can tell one parent, do this, and for one group it hurts, for another group it helps. Right? So the benefits are overstated. And then the other example I'll give is that people say, well, we want to increase achievement for the bottom achievers, right? So let's, let's, let's think of it that way. We have high achievers, we have low achievers. Let's get achievement up. And the way to do that is to get their parents involved. In the book, there's a chapter in which I focus on uh, parental response poor performance, national data. And response poor performance was divided into two groups, punitive, you know, punish, limit activities, and non-punitive. All right, help, you know, with homework, talk to the teacher, encourage a child, things like that. Punitive and non-punitive. And I found that black parents are more likely to engage in punitive. White parents more likely to do non-punitive. Also, social class, same thing, lower class. And even when you look at race by class, doesn't matter, black affluent, black poor, they're doing more punitive. 
than white. Okay? Then you say, okay, now let's look at how these forms of involvement relate to achievement. Even if you just look at whites only and blacks separately, punitive is associated with declines in achievement and non-punitive response associated with increases. So blacks are doing more of what hurts and less of what helps inadvertently because they're responding to poor performance. So the teacher says, hey, I need you to respond. So-and-so is doing poorly. The parent goes home, they're going to activate that policy lever. They're going to say, okay, I'm going I'm to fix this. <laughs> right? They're going to fix it. They go home, they're going to fix it. Right? The problem is that the way they know how to fix it, the way they think to fix it, you could say, I got them involved. You just don't realize you got the parent to pull in a different direction from you. So the question then becomes, do you really want the parents to be involved? Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. It's a mixed bag. That's, that's a minefield, right, to get parents involved. It, it's all over the place, right? Why do affluent people have children who are doing well, right? And the reason why is not because we're better parents, right? The reason why is because there's something associated with our lifestyles that we're living that the kids just breathe in the air. Mm -hmm. You walk in your home and everybody in here probably has a home office. Mm -hmm. Most of your friends have education levels above the national average, right? Mm -hmm. And so I walk through your home and, and the kid says something, you say, on what basis, what do you mean? Uh oh, there's verbal jousting. <laughs> uh oh, I'm being asked to defend my position. There's pushback, you know what I'm saying? Now there's reasoning, there's, <laughs> there's debates, right? And, and the kid is just, it's osmosis, it's in the air, they're just breathing it. Whether you had kids or not, you'd be living this lifestyle. You go to a poor home, you're not going to see those things. That doesn't make you a better parent. It just means you're living a life that's just, you know, related to learning. Anyway, that all that's in the book. So I'm convinced that it's not culture or parents. All right? And uh, my first book, Kids Don't Want to Fail, I... Uh, did a, a, an extensive assessment of this cultural argument, and there was no support. And then parental involvement. Again, um, I didn't find support for this. And in fact, this is not going to close the achievement gap. Right? And in research, we're able to construct a world in which parents are similar on certain behaviors. And when you make those comparisons, the gap is still large, persistent. It's not going to count for the achievement gap. So we can, you can invest in this, and it's going to make you feel better. You'll say, yeah, we're doing it. And you, and you can feel good, right? But don't be surprised if in 10 years, the, the lines are parallel. Because that's not the problem. You're just spinning your wheels. So where should we focus our attention? Okay. So I have five places <clears throat> we should focus our attention, all right? One is testing, bias and testing. Another is early schooling, lack of real dialogue on race, and Lack of understanding of structure, what sociologists call structure. And I think we need a new model of instruction. Okay. Some of this is empirically based and some of it is gut. I'll tell you which is which as we move forward. <laughs> Bias and testing. So when I ask, okay, so what do people think of when, when you hear bias and testing? What does that mean? What does that mean? Yes. A certain test may have specific cultural markers in it that mm -hmm. are that, that benefit one group over another rather than testing actual knowledge or skill. Okay. Yeah. So oftentimes it's you know people respond by saying yeah it's you know uh, the life some people lifestyle that they don't they're not exposed to certain things and so here's where the bias comes in. <clears throat> yes. I'll give you a really good example. I was in New Orleans, out of New Orleans, where Katrina had done so much damage. Thirty percent of the kids were. Um, homeless, and the teacher in one of these very poor schools was asking kids to do a math problem about going to an amusement park, and so the kids worked so hard, but they just were, as I walked around and looked, I started asking one kid after the other, have you ever been to an amusement park? No, ma'am. Do you know what this kind of ride is? No, ma'am. They had absolutely no connection with what, even though they were not far from the ocean, their lifestyle had absolutely no background context for what they were being at. Is that a good example? Very good example. Very good example. And that's how most people conceive of bias and testing. Uh, I want to see what you think after this. <laughs> Read this question. 
And not just varying on stage seem blank. Her movements were natural and her technique blank. The answer is C. All right. Is this question racially biased? Is it racially biased? We well, you know the answer is yes. It's racially biased. <laughs> People will say it's racially biased for the very reason, similar to the example you gave, right? Oh, you know, black folks may not be exposed to dancers, blah, blah, blah. Okay. It's biased, but it's biased against whites. This question is racially biased against whites. When you have an exam, there are a roster of questions, right? And when you create the exam for this year, you don't come up with a total set of new questions every year. It's just too dangerous. What you have to do is you have to get questions from the roster. Because see, we trust these questions. They're, they're measuring what we think they're supposed to be measuring. So we go to the roster and we get questions from the roster. This is how, you know, one of these books, the, the SAT study guides and the LSAT study guides, those are questions from the <laughs> roster. All right? So we, you know, we get these questions from the roster, put them on the exam. New questions make it in. Right? But the new question has to be tested first. So if this year, let's say the exam has 100 questions on it, 98 questions will be from the roster and two will be test items. New questions that aren't on the roster, we're trying them out this year. Right? And when the students turn in their exams, we grade them. Those two questions do not count toward the final score. They're test items. You don't know, the students don't know which one. Right? We have to see if these two questions can make it into the roster. How do we do that? They have to perform similar to these other questions, right? Keep that in mind. Basics of ETS test construction, and this applies for the SAT, LSAT, MCAT, ETS is in it, that's how it goes. Each individual SAT question, each ETS chooses is required to parallel the outcomes of the test overall. So if high scoring test takers, more likely to be white, tend to answer the question correctly in pre-testing, it's a worthy question. If not, it's thrown out. Race and ethnicity are not considered, but racially desperate scores drive question selection, which in turn reproduces a racially desperate test results in an internally reinforcing cycle. Item selection is not random. This is not a quirk of any one particular SAT test. SATs are designed to very strongly correlate with one another. I don't believe SAT or ETS intended for this to be a white preference test. However, the scientific method of test construction leads to this result. The actress bearing question that you just read, and I asked if it's racially biased, looks like a typical SAT question, yet the question differs from others in one important respect. According to ETS, 8% more African Americans than whites answered that question correctly. That's why I said it's biased against whites. Right? Nearly all SAT questions capture something about race that can't be determined until pre-testing. Because it favored blacks, who scored lower on the test overall, this question did not favor high scorers. Therefore, it was rejected for use on the SAT. Mm -hmm. So is this fair? In October 1998, for example, every single question was a white preference question. If I create an exam and I give the exam to everyone in this room, and I go question by question and say, what proportion of females scored correctly and what proportion of males? For each question, I do that. And I only select the questions on which a greater share of females scored correctly, and that becomes the roster. You're going to have a gender gap in achievement. In fact, that's how this pattern makes sense. Right? If year after year, every question on the roster is a female preference question, you're going to have female, males, and it's going to be parallel. That's how that makes sense. That's the bias in testing, all right? And so there are some black preference questions. And this, is just, there's some questions like this in math, too. For whatever reason, there was a movie by uh, Gwyneth Paltrow and um, um, Shallow Hal, Jack Black, a movie called Shallow Hal. And in this movie, Hal, which was uh, Jack Black's character, was a shallow guy who, who uh, dated women on the basis of the exterior, all right? And someone put a spell on him. Uh, the, one of the, these um, motivational speakers. Yes. <laughs> Put a spell on Shallow Hal. And the spell was that he would only see the inner, what's inside of people. So during the movie, 
uh, if you know he's out with his friends and there are some really attractive females, um, if they were ugly on the inside, he would see they had they'd have, you know, hideous characters playing these females from his perspective. That's what he saw. But everyone else saw how they really looked. So he fell in love with Gwyneth Paltrow's character. She was wearing a, a fat suit, right? Kind of like Eddie Murphy the Clumps. But it was a really good suit where it really looked like it was real. It was real. But he saw Gwyneth Paltrow. Through his eyes, she, it was Gwyneth. But everyone else saw Gwyneth in the fat suit. And during the making of that movie, I, Gwyneth was interviewed and she said, you know, during, you know, it takes hours to put this on, take it off. And so we get as many scenes as we can when I'm in it. Uh, and in between takes, you know, I walk through the hotel lobby and the looks that I get are just amazing. People just stare at me. And she's like, I just never knew what it's like to live life in this body. An obese person would look at her and say, that's me every day. You're just getting a glimpse of it, right? That new self gave Gwyneth a new perspective in life. Things are jumping out of her that didn't jump out of her before. Every question, things jump out at people just, just because they lived experience. And these things are related to race. It's a white female, they, the world's, you're experiencing life in a different way, right? And so the problem is that some of these questions, they just resonate with black folks for whatever reason, we don't know. Some of the questions resonate with white folks, right? It just so happens that those who are in, in the lead in achievement, those are the questions, every question has to relate to that. <coughs> and that's related to race. That's the bias of testing. So where should we focus our attention? So one is bias and testing. That's one issue, right? We have to keep that in mind. Second issue is uh, we have to focus early. This is fall of kindergarten. Fall of kindergarten based on national representative data. This is the average achievement for whites. Uh, so if whites are averaging a 20 and Asians are 22, I'm showing you 10 plus two, right? And so this is Asian American achievement, black achievement, fall of kindergarten, national representative data relative to whites. Now, what happens if you account for social class? That is, Just two examples what I give about that. This really brings across structure and agency. If you take five, if you take a thousand people and you divide them into two groups, 500, 500, and you take 500 when they're two years old, all of them, and you take 500 and you say, we're going to move your families to Kansas, and you got you have to live in Kansas. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, you just live in Kansas. You take this other 500 and you put them in Hawaii. And you say, you guys have to live in Hawaii. If you come back 10 years later, where do you think you're going to have a higher proportion of swimmers? <laughs> <laughs> Independent of what the parents do, right. you're going to have a higher proportion of swimmers in Hawaii. Location is the structure. There are some structural advantages to being in Hawaii with, with regard to the outcome of swimming. Now, there's going to be somebody in Kansas who's going to hold on to that individual narrative. They're going to say, I'm in Kansas and I swim like a fish. Look at me. What's wrong with all of y'all? Right. Why y'all can't swim like me? Right. And nothing's stopping me. It's choice. It's personal choice. Mm -hmm. That person doesn't respect structure. Right. right? And so when you don't respect structure, you engage in bad policy making. Right? right? You engage in bad policy making because it's about, you, you, the policies are to address and fix individuals, right? Not, and not structure. Right, so, you, so in order to have 80% of swimmers in, in Kansas the way you have in Hawaii, the, you have to change so much about how life is configured in Kansas. You have to have community pools, you have to have community uh, pool nights, pool events, your life has to, every, think of how much has to shift in order to reach that, that percentage. In Hawaii, what do they have to do? Just walk out my front door, I'm on the beach. There really is nothing to do. There's a huge structural advantage. Hawaii is Chapel Hill. It's Shaker Heights. It's, it's this structure right here. It's this group. Kansas is right here. So if you're from Hawaii and you can't swim, that's an individual problem. Right. <laughs> you in Hawaii, you can't swim. That's something wrong with you. Right? right? That's an individual. Now, if you in Kansas and can't swim, that's not something wrong with you. That the structure there. But if you're in Kansas, you can swim. I'm more impressed by that. Right? That's a structure agency example, right? I like to use donut shops too. <laughs> you got two towns, 50 donut shops, and one. <laughs> people gonna be healthier. <laughs> now, now you're gonna find some people that are gonna find that one donut shop. <laughs> That's why it's in business, right? Because these three keep them in business. They found it. Right? And and down here you have so many donut shops, you're gonna find folks who are gonna resist it. 
right? But that's an individual. That's a success story. They're fighting against their structure. So anytime I think of a kid or a situation, I say, what's the structure we're talking about? What's the structure that that kid is in? And then you say, are they within their structure, right? Or are they superseding their structure? By the same token, if someone is doing something well, I say, oh, that's good. If it's within the structure, I'm not impressed. Oh, that's, that's great. I mean, your parent, you were set up for success. You, you should do this. Yes. All right? So structure agency, we don't, we don't talk about this right. Here's another example. A Fluentville, a hood town. I like giving this one. So Fluentville, you got some nice cars, got a couple of potholes. Hood town, you don't have very, very nice cars. You have a lot of potholes. Now, the goal is to get from here to here. In a Fluentville, most kids make it, right? You got, you know, you always have that knucklehead kid who's always in trouble, parents go bail him out, parents got money, pay for attorney, get him out of trouble, right? But somehow he didn't make it. There's something wrong with this kid. This, this, this is the kid in the rich community who's the bad influence. This is the kid who hung out with him, but he averted that crisis. He, he said, oh, I almost got caught, but, and the parents say, it wasn't easy, but you came through, you know? Just a fluent bill. Now this hood town. Now these folks, I'm going to look over there and say, what's wrong with you guys? You guys can't drive. Why do you guys have more car repair bills than us? We're superior drivers. Drive like us. Watch. Look, look what we're doing. Drive like us. <laughs> right? That's the present problem. Look, look what I'm doing as a parent. Look. <laughs> right? right? Um, and so these people don't respect the structure. Then if you put more potholes here, it ain't gonna, it's not going to look like this. All right? These folks here, when you black, in most cases, when you're black and you make it up here, there is a story. There's a story there. Every black person has a story. I just told you mine, but there's a story. You navigated something, right? Stars have to line up in some kind of way. Uh, and so this, this is usually what happens. You also have that one black <laughs> who's here That's right. and says, I made it. What's wrong with the rest of y'all? That's right. Look at me. He walks in with his bow tie and starts to, you know, <laughs> you know that's, that, that's, the, that's the, yeah, that's, that's the Cosby, that's the Cosby and, not the sex Cosby, I'm talking about the Cosby, the other Cosby, right? I'm talking about the other Cosby, before all that came out, when he was up there, you know, that's that guy, look at, preaching, you know, what's wrong with y'all black folk, you know? Um, they don't respect structure. We don't respect structure. Leads to bad policy making. So that's issue number three, right? Um, testing, we have to focus early, and we don't understand structure. Race. This is a tough one. This one people get uncomfortable about. And I only have what? Two more slides? Race. People get. That's deceptive though, because you know I have slides within slides. Anyway, so, <laughs> so we have. Uh, so we have uh, uh, there's bias in test there's bias in terms of teachers. So I'll give you I'll give you one example here. There was a study in which uh, four, two two kids were asked white kid and a black kid were asked to be white for the day. They were told today be white for today just be white black kid and a white kid and they were follow around with video camera. So just be white for the day. What does that mean? You know, they're white for the day. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Hey, John. You know, <laughs> pants up. You know, they were white for the day. You know how white people, you know how y'all do. You know, you, know, you know how white people talk. You know, telephone voice. <laughs> Hi, um, this is John. You know, you have that voice. <laughs> they did that for the whole day. The next day they were told, be black for the day. <laughs> so what does that mean? Just have swagger. You know, just be comfortable. You know, just what's up? Just be black. And they were video recorded. Those videos were shown to teachers, and the teachers were asked to rate the children in terms of problem behaviors, the need for special education, and achievement. And they rated the black for a day worse on all three, just on the basis of the videos. <laughs> just on the basis of the videos, no other data. Right? That's tapping into some unconscious bias that's there. There's some unconscious bias. We all have it. There's no honor in saying, oh, I don't see color. Right. And that's foolish. Right? Um, the reality is that we all have these biases, and the key is to check them. And a lot of them sit in our blind spots. 
I have it. When I'm sitting on campus, it is one, you know, I'm walking through campus one day and I hear a kid, you know, yelling, you know, trying to get someone's attention, Sarah, across campus. And I turn around and I cringe and I say, please don't be black. <laughs> and then it's a white person. I go, oh, <laughs> because the same is not the same. It doesn't look the same. Black kid yelling across campus, it just looks worse. White kid yelling across campus, oh, she's trying to get Sarah's attention. It's just the same is not the same. You walk down the sidewalk and you see three or four black guys coming toward you, it looks different than you see three or four Asian guys walking towards you. The same is not the same. There's, that's an internal bias we all have. I don't know how you get around that, but we're all socialized in the same space, and that's the bias we have. This is why, you know, black folks, when we, I don't know if white folks know this or not, but you could drop any black person off anywhere in the country and tell them walking down the street and the, they see a black person they've never seen before, they don't go, what's up, you? <laughs> I don't care. You, you get in the elevator, see a black person, so. never seen them before. And that's just the rule. I don't know why that happens. My students say, up if you know them, down if you don't. <laughs> right? But there's that green. I don't see white folks doing that to each other. But black folks always do that. We don't engage in dialogue about race. We don't talk about race. Right? And so um, here are two schools. It's a predominantly black school, predominantly white school. Every group has a dialogue about race. Black folks, we talk about race all the time when white folks leave the room. <laughs> Latinos do the same thing, right? So there's a dialogue we have about race. I assume this dialogue whites have about race, right? But he's not a part of it. It might be about him. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's this dialogue. So what are some of the things that black folks say about whites? You can't trust them. They wear shorts in the winter. They don't see their privilege. They stereotype us. These are all the things we say about y'all when you're not around. I talk, we, we talk, we, we, we gonna say it, we talk. Why folks have a dialogue? What do they say? I don't know, right? Because I haven't been privy to that dialogue. But what I'm trying to say here is that there's superficial dialogue between the groups. <clears throat> You're not really talking about race in a serious way. People tense up, white folks tense up, it's a, it's a minefield. You don't know if you're gonna step on the wrong thing and get blown up. Scary discussion to have if you're white, right? Uh, and whites aren't free to make mistakes. And that's a problem, because I think that we have to be able to talk about race in an open and honest way. If you say something that's racist, we have to be able to say, you know what? The journey you have lived, if we put a hidden camera and followed you around for your whole life, and we get to this point, we would say, that statement makes sense given the journey we've followed. And I can't make you feel bad for your lived experience. But what I can do is say, okay, um, so some people view it this way, Here's an alternative way of saying it, you know. Here's because you have to. We have to, we have to learn how to have dialogue about race, and we don't know how to do that. We don't have real it's superficial dialogue. We don't talk about it, and that's a big problem we have, right? So the final thing that I'm going to say is, I think we need to focus on a new model of education. I don't know what that looks like. I don't have the answer. I don't know what it is, but we need a different game. Right now, if you tell me we have to change the game of basketball, changing it is not widening the court by one foot raising the rim by one inch. It's the same game. That's an incremental change. It's the same game. You still recognize it. We need to have four baskets on the court. And the court needs to be shaped like a cross. Seven players. That's a different game. If we sit down and think hard enough, we can come up with some rules for that. But that's a different game. You understand it's a different model. That's what we need in education. We need something different. One of the things that I'm trying to do toward that end is I'm doing a study in Wake County. Uh, funded by close to $2 million by the U.S. Department of Education, and Wake County made 32 schools available, and we sorted 16 schools into the control group and 16 schools into the experimental group. In the experimental group, we're implementing a, pro uh, a program called Project Bright Idea. That's the name for the U.S. Department of Education. For Wake County, they're calling it Nurturing for Bright Tomorrow. Essentially, what we're doing is, in those 16 schools, uh, the kindergarten is K through 2 intervention. The kindergarten <laughs> teachers, and the first grade teachers this year now, uh, kindergarten teachers are doing it this year, last year and this year. We have two cohorts, last year's kindergarten class, who are now in first grade, and this year's kindergarten class. And what happens is the teachers get trained during the summer, 
to implement Project Broad Idea. It's a different model of instruction. And then they go off and teach what they teach, teach the same curriculum, whatever it is, but they do it through the filter of Broad Idea. And we're in the second year of that study. And in year one, we showed some positive effects. Uh, the, the experimental group, the kids in the experimental group, experienced a greater gain in achievement over the course of the year than those in the control group. Uh, modest gain, but significant. And so now we're in year two of that, and we're going to go for five years. And the goal is that in year three, in year four, we want to see if a greater share of the kids in the experimental group are identified for gifted and talented than those in the control group. But the assumption is that all, we're teaching all kids as if they're gifted and talented. Because we don't know who's kid number 217. So we got to assume they all are. And so that's what I'm doing in Wake County, and with that, I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Harris. And as you can imagine, there's requests for your slides presentation. I'm not sure if that's something that we can work out. We'll, we'll talk about on the sidebar in terms of getting you the information. We lost two sites, I think. I think we lost UNC Charlotte and East Carolina. We have UNC Asheville still active with us. Uh, so we're going to use our <laughs> lunch period for a little bit of Q&A. Dr. Parizio and Dr. Harris are both remaining uh, to answer any questions that you might have uh, since we always get through the slides fairly quickly. Lunch is being served outside. Um, feel free to come back inside afterwards, and we'll start the Q&A once we get everybody kind of situated again. If you have to take off, feel free to grab lunch and take it with you if at all possible. Uh, and then we'll have some closure after the Q&A. Uh, so, so feel free to refer back to um, the two presentations and pose any questions that you might have. And uh, we'll make a hard stop at about 1 o'clock. And USC Asheville will also give you an opportunity to pose any questions. So feel free to inject at any point. Um, so I just had a question for Dr. Harris. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned that you have a one of the, I think the slide when you were showing about the kindergartners and then how they got started. I wondered how preschool education fits in that, or is the implication that it doesn't make a big difference because of the you should be kind of starting? So I was just wondering yeah. to speak to that. Well, I mean, I'm sure, you know, preschool matters in the sense that. You're getting information that you wouldn't be exposed to at all, you know. So it doesn't matter. But at the end of the day, I think um, obviously it's not it's not something that is um, it's not something that's addressing the issue because the gap widens once they get into school. You see what I'm saying? And so um, the I think I mean there's something to be said for having an intervention before they get into school, but I think that um, we have to have Right, I agree with that. I was just curious if what sort of the measurement or how yeah. they're measured. I mean, the way the graph was, right, it was sort of where it showed they were like next to each other at kindergarten. So, how is that determined or what? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, there, well, there's still a gap in kindergarten. Uh, there's a gap in kindergarten. When they start kindergarten. Yeah, there's a gap in okay. they start kindergarten. The, what I showed you was the gap. Uh, in the world in which blacks and whites have similar socioeconomic status. That's the one where they're, you know, and so like up there, the first, the first two dots are the world as it is, there's a gap in kindergarten. And then if you simply compare kids who are similar with regard to social class, that's what the second dots are called kindergarten. And so, um, yeah, that's math and this is reading. And so, so you can't just focus on the um, fall kindergarten second dots, because that's that's controlling for social class. Any other questions? For Dr. Oh, um, yes, I, I have a question. Um, for Dr. Um, Harris again, um, could you tell us a little bit about the teacher training that you do for the Bright Ideas Project? Sure. So during the summer, teachers get trained, and uh, that training focuses on uh, we focus on thinking skills. So front end has three components. One is thinking skills. Another is uh, learning styles, and the third is called habits of mind. And so essentially, what we do is 
uh, teachers are trained in how to uh, focus on these three things during the course of their day in the classroom. And we have a, uh, you know, they're trained, it's a full day training for three days over the summer, and then they come back in the fall for one day, then in the spring for a day. Uh, and uh, when they come in the fall and the spring, Wake County assigns substitute teachers for them. And essentially those training, the full day training, they receive uh, examples on how to implement thinking skills during the course of the day. So we have, teach, we have people that provide model lessons uh, and, um, and then some of the trainings we focus on the blended, you know, blending all three effectively. And during the school, so essentially what the teachers are doing is that they're focusing on the thinking skills, which are, uh, and these are kindergartners, remember kindergarten, first, second graders, they focus on um, uh, describing uh, similarities, differences, seeing a connection between things, uh, uh, classifying things, and so these are the these are the, the, the things that teachers emphasize among kindergartners. So whatever you're teaching, you try to funnel it through that. And the same thing with uh, learning styles. Uh, there's a learning style inventory, and uh, what happens is that teachers, whatever you're teaching, you try to funnel the information through four different learning styles. And so if you are learning style one, uh, when the teacher is talking about it in that way, you're going to excel, it's gonna make sense to you. Uh, and when they move on, uh, you'll strengthen the other forms of learning styles. Cause you know, we all have some portion of these four um, and they are, one is, um, you know, the person that likes things to be a certain way. Uh, tell me what I need to know, give me the steps, what's the order, very systematic, very, uh, another is the person who uh, is, uh, self-expressive, and so these are people who learn best by talking about their experiences, learning from other people's experiences. These are the talkers in class. Um, then there are people who um, learn by, you know, you give them the steps, but they look at it and then they question you and you say, that's not what I want you to get from it, but technically you're right. They muddy the waters, make things complicated. You know, we all know somebody like that. We say, actually, blah, 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 you're like, you're right, but that's not where I want to go. But you're right, <laughs> and that kid can get into, that kid gets himself into trouble all the time, right? Um, and then there's the person who is the explores the what ifs about life. So um, they are always thinking about alternative scenarios, posing alternative, um, you know, parts of the story or whatever. And so we try to make sure that all of us have some of those in us, but we're more in one category than the other. And uh, teachers are uh, make sure that they pay attention to this as they go forward. Um, yeah. I have a question. I'm still trying to process that parent involvement has mixed results. I'll leave it at that. But how can we? There's. I also hear from parents of concern about extending the school year as a way of removing children from the home or <clears throat> being concerned about losing time with having losing time that children have with their family. So how can we both give kids more time in school, but also involve parents more to support that time in Have you thought of, are there strategies we could know as a school system? First, let me thank you for the work you do with Lake County right. Schools. It's, it's exciting. I should have started with that, so thank you, sir. Um, but how can we get our parents supportive of public education research and knowledge that we know is best for children? Uh, so that's tricky. Uh, yes. The first thing is I, I would say um, you have to go into it with the understanding and assumption that parents do not know what they're doing. Right? Okay, so, so, so you have to start that. Remember, that's really treacherous. That would be great. <laughs> and, and when I say that, I mean the outcome is Reading, math, and grades. That's it, nothing else, nothing more. That's all I'm talking about, just on those outcomes. That's it. Okay. Um, and so. Thank you for that. And so they, when, so, 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 another, so if you involve parents, you have to understand that um, if you say, here are things that parents should be doing, you can't just say, do these things. And then you say, oh, I solved it. And they go off and do these things. Because what you, don't, what, what you may not realize is they're going to implement these things differently depending on who you're talking to, right? And so in the study, for some groups, reading to the child wasn't associated with gains and achievement, right? And so for some, for some groups, right? Um, what that means is the parents say, I'm reading, right? But I could read to you like this, 
or I can read to you like this. I'm doing, I'm reading, right? But if you go to the home, you could say, I see why that form of involvement doesn't help. I see it. It's, it's what they're doing. They just don't, you know, they, they don't know. Uh, and so parents have good intentions, but they, they, when I say they don't know what they're doing, what I mean is they don't know how to be involved. When it comes to helping with homework, that seems to hurt every group, no matter what. They're helping, but they don't know how to help. It's not, I'm not saying in a bad way. They just don't know how to help. And There's a project effective. at Lockhart Elementary. Are you aware of, that's working with the group? And I can't remember the specifics, but they are they are once a month meeting with parents and help showing them how to help with homework. So it's hands-on, very intentional ways of helping parents help their child at home. So I'll, oh, I'll, yes. I'll, do you know about that? I'll, no, I'll, I don't. I'll the parents, the parents to need to be, see. any intervention that involves parents, I think you have to assume, okay, even if you don't say it to them, they know what they're doing. So we're going to involve mm -hmm. them, right. but we know that they don't know what they're doing. Therefore, we have to help them learn how to be involved. Because let's be honest, by the fifth grade, <clears throat> most parents, most what kids are learning is beyond most of us. Mm -hmm. Even if we're well educated, you seen that show, we're smart in fifth grader. <laughs> Remember that show, we're smart in fifth grader. That's right. That's you, right. you say, you know, at, at that point, you say, bring me the book. Let me see. And you got to teach it to yourself first. <laughs> I'm, I'm helping in a fifth grade classroom in a math classroom. I have to pay attention so yes. that I can help the children because I don't remember how to do it. It starts to challenge you, and so we have to remember that. And so we do we, it's saying parents should be involved, get them involved, go do these things, and leave them to their own devices. That is dangerous. <laughs> and so I think, um, so that's so you can involve parents, but when you do that, understand that you have to have some component or some mechanism by which you talk about what involvement means, how to do it, how to do it effectively, and not get in the way. You know, the kid with the best science project didn't learn as much as the kid whose science project is kind of clunky, because they actually did Absolutely. it. Yeah. Thank you. Quick question. <clears throat> how do you do that in a way... How do you involve parents and give those suggestions in a way that's not patronizing? Because what I, coming out of the classroom, what I experience with other educators who maybe don't uh, have as much experience in urban ed, which is where my experience has been, is that there's something wrapped in the critique of parenting, right? That it's very pathologizing, <laughs> that comes across as uh, judgmental. And how do you say that and have that internal monologue and say they don't know what they're doing, but it's not, it not be rooted in some sort of cultural bias. Yeah. And then secondly, the suggestions you make actually be things that move the needle without yeah. them being more cultural. Yeah. So my job as a researcher is to identify these things. Okay. And then you guys' job is to then tell the parents, right. Right. hey, <laughs> this is what's happening. Right? And so, um, but having said that, uh, this might... Um, provide some clarity. So in the Broken Compass, in the book, uh, there is a figure, uh, the actual, actual book. there's a figure in here that I think would be helpful. Um, should be opening up. Here we go. Is that one published, available? Yeah, this, oh, is okay. published. this is published. Yeah, so this is published, uh, it was published in 2014. Uh, so I'm going straight to the figure. Gotta find it. It's right here. Here, here it is. Here. So if you look at this figure, okay. So the way the way to read this figure is this. Let me just focus on. While Dr. Harris is looking for that, <clears throat> UNC Asheville, we have a hard stop at 1 o'clock. So we just want to thank you for participating. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me uh, with any further questions that you might have. Okay, so if you look at this here, um, what, you'll, uh, what you'll see is across the top, you'll see forms of personal involvement, right? So, so uh, it's kind of hard to see the small. Regularly talk about school experiences, regularly talk about high school, regularly talk about uh, post high school plans, rule about homework, rule about GPA. We have all these forms of involvement, right? And this is white. So just for white, if you have a, if there's, if there's a circle here, this means that this, the parents who did this, those kids had higher achievement than the parents who did not do this. So that means this form of involvement is associated with increase in achievement. 
So this helps white achievement. This here doesn't no no relationship. Doesn't matter if you do it or don't. No relation, no relation. This is negative. In other words, parents who do this, your kids do worse than the parents who don't do this. So positive, not significant, negative. When you look across, it's a mixed bag. Seven positives, four negatives, 16 non-significant. That's white. Asians A are uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, your model minorities. Asians B are your disadvantaged Asians, Southeast Asians, non-Mexican Americans, Mexicans, Blacks. What I just showed you, this is just for reading achievement. When we look at math achievement, it's their ball game. Right, so this helps whites in reading. Doesn't help them in math, but it helps them in reading. Right? Uh, blacks seem to benefit from this. Not whites, but blacks benefit from talking about high school plans and post high school plans. That seems to benefit black kids. Doesn't benefit white kids. That doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean it hurts white kids. It just means it is no added no benefit for it. But for black kids, they get a bang for the buck in math. Now you go off and you get this list of parents say. Here are all the things you can do. Do as many as you can. That's like pressing all the keys to the piano at the same time. It doesn't sound good. And there's some landmines in here. They are gonna, they, they might focus more on some that are negative. And these, they're going to be spinning their wheels. They'll feel good because they're involved, right? Um, and so it's a mixed bag. And this is for grades. This is for grades. So at the end of it, you see that there were, uh, if you look at this form of involvement, it was only positive twice for whites in reading and for Mexican-Americans in grades, right? Negative three times, not significant 13 times. If you pull across, there are 58 positives, 68 negatives, and 360 non-significant. That's what I mean when I say the benefits of parental involvement are grossly overstated. It can be a resource, but it's a resource without maximizing. Because right now, they're not, we're not, it's not being employed correctly. So that's what I mean by parental involvement is not as effective as people think it is. Because they don't know what they're doing. If you tell if you leave parents with advice, more of what they do is gonna hurt than help. Yep. But that seems to be the crux of where we now find ourselves. Because can you imagine now we go into a group of parents at night and we say, All right, here's a sheet of paper for all the white parents. Here's a sheet of paper for all the black parents. Here's your list of what you white parents need to do with your kids, because if you do some of these other things, it's not going to do any good. And if you do these other things, it's going to be bad. Now, for the black parents, here are the good. But that's what that is. Right. Yeah, but that it, is what that is. Yeah, but, but that's not how you would use this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a diagnostic. So this is internal in-house. We say, OK. When black folks do this, it's hurting. It's good for us to know. As a teacher, it's a diagnostic. So you say, okay, so I know this in-house. When black folks do this, when white folks do this, this hurts. Black folks get back to the buck on this. Okay, now I go out and talk to the parents. It's a mixed group of parents. Black, whites, everybody. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to have me a list of the things that were negative to anybody. And I'm going to say, here are some things that some parents engage in that are associated with declines in achievement. And so we need to talk about how it is that parents are engaging in this. Some of you do this, some, not everyone does this, some people do, some people don't, but this is, seems negative. So let's have a discussion about how, how would you do this, right? And so for a white parent, it may not matter, but black parent, it does matter, but you don't know that. You're just a parent sitting there and we're just talking about how to help with homework. You see what I'm saying? And so it's a diagnostic on, think of it as things where people are having problems with, right? And so you focus on the things that are negative. Those that are positive, you might emphasize and say, OK, so here's something that seems to benefit some parents when you do this, this, this. And you talk about how to do these things. And somewhere it doesn't matter. You say, now, some parents do this, but the research shows that this doesn't seem to be associated with achievement. Uh, but if we wanted to be associated with achievement, we could maybe implement it this way. You see what I'm saying? And so it's a diagnostic tool. Not, it's not something you would have a, a card for each ratio group. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to um, end our session, our reservation in virtual land as well as physical spaces coming to a close. So thank you again, uh, Lil and Angel. For yeah. the well, at this point in time, I guess that brings us to our close. Uh, we're going to make this available uh, for our review. Um, <laughs>
video portion. Uh, and we're going to be talking about next steps. You guys know our next meeting is February the 10th, right? As a racial equity committee. Look for further instructions on that. Um, it'll be half working session where we're trying to work towards producing this document with recommendations. Uh, so just be looking for more email correspondence about that. Thank everybody. Thank you everybody for taking the time to come out and uh, hopefully this is accomplishing our, our objectives as a, as a group. Appreciate it. Thank you.